Hi, right, class. Today's discussion, pension expense and pension liabilities and how uh, that is handled uh, in the accounting for companies. And so I'm gonna share my screen and talk about it uh, here with you. All right, here we go. Let me uh, move this. We're gonna work some pension problems too, so you'll see all of that. Okay. Let's think about what a pension is. There's two, really two kinds, and you'll see this in the textbook. There's um, a defined benefit uh, pension, and there's also a defined contribution. A defined contribution, uh, I'm gonna just set that aside, because that's the easy one. Uh, companies uh, will usually match, uh, employees will put, this is a 401k, if you will. Uh, uh, companies will, have some percent of their salary, usually it's around three to 6% withheld. Companies will match that. So it's defined contribution. The company will contribute to um, someone like Fidelity, a, a brokerage uh, firm, and contribute that money on your behalf into your account. It's a defined contribution and it's your money. And so they'll match that and you just can, whenever you retire, how much ever uh, the companies has put aside and what you put aside, that's your money. And, and it's over. The company, after they contribute money to uh, your account, they're done. And so they have no future liability. And that's uh, the contributions are defined. They make those contributions. Everyone moves on. And if you leave the company, uh, you can take that 401k plan with you. Now, a defined uh, benefit plan is different uh, because we're going to define, the company is going to have a plan a contract with the employees that they're going to guarantee on a, a monthly benefit of to the employee after they retire. So let's just think about that for a minute. Let's say a company starts at uh, 30 years old and they work for a company uh, for 35 years of service. Hard to believe. <laughs> that would happen anymore, but um, it wasn't uh, that different in the future. And then uh, in the past, this happened. Uh, and so it, at the, when the employee is 65 years old, he will take a pension plan, he or she, and it'll be annual payments, uh, usually monthly payments, until death. Hopefully that's many years out. So just think about, let's go back to that first year because um, that employee has worked for the company for one year and then 34 years later, he's going to start getting some benefits. And so um, there has to be at the end of that year, the company has a liability and therefore they have an expense. So they're going to have to debit um, pension expense. And they're going to credit. Um, here's what we call uh, projected benefit obligation. It's called the PBO. That's nothing more than a pension liability for what that one year is worth in um, uh, in for future payments. And this is going to be. I know you ladies love time value of money. This is a very complex time value of money problem. Um, think about all the uncertainties related to this. Okay, number one, nobody knows uh, how long uh, each person is going to live, but we do have mortality tables that on average we can know that. Uh, by the way, uh, mortality tables change every year, and we're all living a lot longer than we used to. That's great for us, but it's not great for pension expense for companies. So pension expense uh, has been growing, and pension um, benefit obligation has been growing uh, because uh, people are living longer. These payments are going to come out and be uh, paid for a much longer time than they were 40, 50 years ago. Now, uh, so you think about each year of service, we're going to have to debit pension expense and, um, and credit that uh, pension benefit obligation for what that extra year of service. Now, um, each year of service
the increase in the pension benefit obligation, we call that service cost. So how much the PBO has grown from one additional year of service, we call that the service cost element. By the way, you will not have to calculate that in for this course. And when you're in a company, fortunately, we do not have to account, uh, calculate that as accountants because we will uh, hire actuarial firms who are experts in this, in the complex math and, and deal with uh, uh, not just mortality, but future salary increases and every, there's a whole ton of assumptions that go into this and actuaries, actuaries put this into their big black box that calculates what the service costs in the PBO is. So uh, fortunately, uh, you will not have to calculate that for that course, that'll be given to you. Now, because we present value this back at a certain rate, um, we will also each year, we are going to incur interest costs. So whatever that PBO was here, when we moved from year one to year two, for, for not just this employee, but for all employees, we're gonna have an interest expense on that PBO. That's a second piece. Now, a third piece, uh, and this happens, let's say we go out to year 10. This is year 10 here. And the employee changes the formula. By the way, they can never, by law, take anything away from what you've already earned. But what companies do is they change the formula so that employees will get higher benefits. Now, why would they do that? Because that, I guarantee you, never ever happened to me as a salaried employee, but union employees, they, uh, as they negotiate a new union contract, many times they will negotiate an improved pension benefit. Now, here's how that works. Let's say this employee has been with the company for 10 years. Uh, when, when a new uh, formula is calculated, it's retroactive back to year zero. And so whenever uh, that happens, this employee gets a big windfall for the 10 years they've already worked. And so it's a one-time deal. And so um, amendment to plan, that's what we call a prior service cost. And so it's gonna be an increase in the PBO, projected benefit obligation, for work that's already been performed. So for these 10 years, maybe we thought it was gonna be um, $1,000 times a year of service or whatever, and then it became $1,200 times a year of service. And so the company, get, he, the employee gets a windfall back here, and suddenly the PBO grows in leaps and bounds because of not the work that was done this year in service costs, but just, hey, a windfall to the employee for the last 10 years of service. And that's a special one called prior service costs. Now, at the end of each year, every single year, uh, companies with pensions have to hire an actuary to reevaluate their pension plan. Um, according to the FASB, this has to be done now at, at December 31st. So the actuaries do not have a lot of time for companies trying to close their books in two or three weeks uh, to, to calculate this. A lot of things change over 12 months. Number one thing that can change is interest rates because this, the present value of this is, is discounted back at an interest rate, which we call the discount rate. If the discount rate goes down, guess what? The PBO goes up, it works in the opposite direction. If the interest rate uh, increases, the PBO declines. By the way, you think about you know, thousands and thousands of employees uh, that are out there and all that, that future payments that we're making, a change in a discount rate could just have a massive, uh, lar massively large change in the PBO. I think at Maytag where I worked, just a 25% reduction in the discount rate could have like a $50 million change on the PBO. Really, really big. And so uh, now what we call these, and another thing that could change, let me just uh, stop there for a second. Mortality cha tables change every year. And so it looks like it is, 
is we've experienced in, in the recent 10, 20 years, mortality tables have been telling us that people are, on average are gonna live longer. That also uh, increases the PBO. Now what we call these are um, uh, changes in assumptions, let's say, they're called actuarial gains and losses. And we're gonna talk about how we treat these. And so those actuarial gains and losses will, in their increases, a, a gain, by the way, is a reduction in the PBO. So the company has a lower obligation, that would be a gain. If it's a loss, it means the PBO has increased. So increased mortality tables, uh, employees are living longer, the PBO goes up, it increases, therefore that's an actuarial loss. It was an, um, maybe good for the employee to live longer, but it was a greater obligation for the employer because now they've got to pay uh, benefits for a longer time period. So you can see all, all the uh, certainty there. So that's one side of this thing. Now here's another side the company is going to set aside assets. And we call these pension plan assets or plan assets. Uh, these assets uh, are contributed to a, and given to a fiduciary, a, a trustee. Uh, for example, at Linux, we use Fidelity. So Fidelity um, kept all the funds we put into the trust. And by law, once the, uh, you set aside, assets aside in the trust, you can no longer use those for the company's purposes. They are completely 100% secured for paying the pen pension benefits. So pension um, benefits are paid from the trust where we keep the plan assets. And so um, again, very large amounts and then companies uh, will work with fiduciaries and with their trustee and they will invest in um, stock sometimes, you know, real estate, there's all different kind of items, uh, corporate uh, bonds. And so they will invest these. And so every year there also is gonna be increase, or well, I should say increase or decrease based on, um, returns on investments or return on assets. And so every year here, uh, we'll have interest, capital gains, maybe capital losses. And so these plan assets will go up and down. By the way, that's also got to affect the net liability, by the way. Now, one last thing I'm gonna say here is, so we have a PBO at the end of each year. That's the obligation. And then we have assets and uh, you know, these do not end up on the balance sheet separately. We net them. If the PBO is larger, then we have a liability on the balance sheet. By the way, we call this an underfunded plan larger assets, then we just have an asset on the balance sheet. So that's very important. Okay, let's take one dive down a little bit lower here. Um, we're, we're eventually working towards uh, doing problems on this and uh, problems in journal entries like you will have to do on the exam. And so let's go to the next, uh, next page here. So let's think about this in a minute here. So the PBO, we have a beginning balance. It's gonna grow, as we've already talked about, plus service costs and extra as employees, all of our employees are working an additional year. Uh, they're uh, use all the all 100% of pension plan benefits are based on years of service times some rate per year. 
And so an extra year of service uh, means the employees will have a higher uh, pension plan benefit. So um, that, that extra year of service adds to the PBO. We also have interest cost. So whatever the discount rate we're using, we'll have to increase that beginning balance with the interest cost. The interest rate times that beginning balance will be an interest cost. We may or may not have a plan benefit that year. So prior service cost, we talked about what that is, uh, that will increase the PBO. And we, that's always an increase because we can never give people a lower benefit. We always have to give them a higher benefit. And when it's retroactive to the first year of service, that's what we call an increase in the obligation uh, due to a prior service cost. And then we could have also plus or minus actual, actual, let me, uh, I'm trying to write too fast here. Actuarial, I'm going to say it this way, losses or gains. In other words, if the, uh, if this act, if there's assumption change an increased mortality table or a lower discount rate, uh, and, the, and the PBO increases, that would be a loss. If the actuarial assumption uh, results in a lower PBO, that would be a gain. And the last thing we do, hey, as we pay benefit payments, that reduces the PBO. And we get to ending balance. Let's think about the plan assets on the other side the offset, if you will, to the PBO. We have the beginning balance. Um, plus or minus asset returns. You know, that would be capital gains, capital losses, uh, interest, dividends that get paid into, you know, off the investments. And um, plus in the employer, contributions every year, the employer will have to contribute to these assets. Employees are somewhat slow at times to contribute uh, because uh, that once they contribute the asset into the plan assets, into the trust, they cannot use that for dividends. They can use it for any other purposes. By law, it's locked away. That's why we don't, that's why we net these on the balance sheet. We don't put the plan assets on the asset side of the balance sheet because they're not really assets of the company. They're assets of the pension plan. And so, uh, let me just change that. Employee contributions here. And so the employees, in the, that's why a lot of funds are significantly underfunded. And by law now, uh, the uh, federal government is requiring minimum contributions to pension plans. How can they enforce that on companies? Well, these employer contributions are tax deductible. And if your plan is not qualified, if you're not following uh, what we call the ERISA guidelines, then that employer contribution will not be tax deductible. And your employees will also know that now we're not a qualified plan. And so employees are very serious. They, they follow the law and the rules and they have to file um, pension plan uh, annual reports with the U.S. government and to all uh, pension beneficiaries or potential pension beneficiaries. I get these from both Whirlpool and from Linux because I, I am a pension plan beneficiary myself and uh, I'm starting to get uh, pension benefits. And that's not a bad thing. Hopefully there will be for a long time <laughs> you know, that that last day will be uh, way, way out there. And then finally, just like here, uh, we will pay benefit payments from the plan assets, not from the company money. It comes out of plan assets, and we have an ending balance. Now, this is the reality of what happens every year in a pension plan financially. The obligation is going to grow. In the at, or you know, it could decline if you had big actuarial gains. Seem like they mostly grow these days. And then um, the plan assets are also going to change. So these are the, the factors that change. And so we have to have a way of calculating 
the um, expense. Now, here is uh, an issue. These actuarial gains and losses can be massively large. Uh, if I go back to my Maytag days, sometimes these could be two, three, four hundred million dollars. And we were, the net income of the company was probably like one to two hundred million. So it would just massively impact financial statements every year. And it'd be a lot of volatility. It could be up four hundred million one year, down four hundred million another year, because uh, a lot of that actuarial gains and losses, keep in mind, is around the discount rate. So as interest rates change, there could be a lot of volatility in the calculation of the PBO. And some of these changes could just overwhelm an income statement. So it would be kind of, it might not be a good picture of the company's business because uh, we're more interested in the operating performance. And so uh, what uh, the FASB rules and what you're gonna learn both with prior service costs and actual gains and losses, we don't record them right away into the income statement. We will set aside these big changes in other comprehensive income and accumulated other comprehensive income, AOCI and equity, and then amortize that into uh, pension expense. And so there's gonna be an amortization here. And by the way, same thing here on the plan asset side. On the plan asset side, you could have big gains or losses on, uh, in, on the plan assets. Uh, we had a couple, a couple billion dollars in plant assets. So the market went down 10%. That could be a $200 million loss. So the same thing here, we, we, we smooth these in to net income, the, the actual gains and losses. We call that kind of an actual gain and loss. If our return is less than we expected or more than we expected, that is something we also record into accumulated other comprehensive income. So that's kind of the, the one big curve here. Having said that, this is pretty formulaic. I think if you, you study this, you can do well. This is very manageable, I think. And I actually kind of love the math of it. So pension expense. First thing we pick up, that's easy, plus service costs. That was an increase for an extra year of service. So that comes right into pension expense. Interest to cost, also interest cost. Now, here is a, a bit of a curve for you. In asset returns, we're going to do minus the expected return. We'll see how this works when we work a problem here. If our expected return is 10% uh, on the assets, regardless of what happens here, let's see we lose, let's say we had a billion dollars that lost 20%, uh, 200 million. Let's say the asset return was an asset loss of 200 million, but we expected to make 10 million, we still would subtract 10% times a billion, 100 million. We would assume like 100 million. That would be $300 million different if you followed the math I just laid out. And we'll see some of this as we work some problems. If you're if I'm moving too fast for you, don't worry. We'll work some problems together here and we'll see that. So we subtract. It's kind of, it's really a hypothetical uh, return that we wished it was sometimes, or sometimes it could be less. Maybe we made a lot more in the market, uh, but we do not use actual returns here to reduce pension expense. Again, that difference is going to go over into AOCI. And then um, now we'll start amortizing. Amortization. Uh, prior service costs, and I put a plus there because that's always an increase in the PBO. And so we'll amortize, you know, if we take one big change this year, every future year for, you know, um, uh, it, for the rest of the remaining um, uh, working, line, working uh, term of the employees, we'll uh, amortize in the prior service costs. And then we'll amortize, and this could be a plus or minus amortization of uh, actuarial losses gains. By the way, I put a loss there first because an increase in the PBO is a loss 
and that would increase expense. Again, you could have a, a large gain that gets amortized also, and that would be a minus. And that is total pension expense. So there you go. That one page there uh, kind of lays everything out. Now, again, if you were in my class, I would pass this spaghetti chart out to you, which is a, a little hard, I know. Um, so here, I know this one is plan assets from the left, not the, and here's PBO down here, projected benefit obligation or pension benefit obligation. So uh, beginning balance, okay, plus expected investment return, that would come right down into pension expense. The actual, the difference between the actual return uh, or loss versus the expected, that difference is gonna come up here into other comprehensive income. Uh, employer contributions, that's no change to pension expense. We'll just uh, credit employee cash, uh, company's cash credit and then debit plan assets for that and then less uh, pension uh, uh, benefit payments. All right, down here, PBO, it increases with the service cost, 100% straight to pension expense. Interest cost, straight to pension expense. But any large changes in prior service costs or actuarial gains and losses, they first come up here to other comprehensive income. And then they get amortized. By the way, where's other comprehensive income? It's sitting over in equity. Just briefly to talk, and this may be the first time you've really seen a lot about uh, um, OCI or accumulated uh, compre other comprehensive income and equity. Here's what the FASB faced with. They wanted to recognize the full PBO, that you have these very large benefit obligations, underfunded pension plans. They want to make sure they recognize that, but they didn't want to have all the full amounts hitting the um, income statement and just swamping the income statement with these large gains and losses and all the volatility on pension assumptions and asset plan assets. It would just overwhelm the income statement. So they only recognize part of it. And this difference here goes over to other companies. And there's other uh, things that do hit other comprehensive income, like foreign currency translation adjustments and other things. And so it sits over here. And then over time, we amortize that into income. I call um, OCI is the big bucket. We put stuff that we don't want to hit the income statement, uh, maybe right now or maybe forever. But here we, uh, in pension, this difference goes here temporarily and we take uh, little bits and pieces out each year and record it into uh, income. Hopefully that helps. Again, this might be an area, if you're confused right now, pull the textbook out understand the textbook. And with that, let's start working some problems and maybe that will help this uh, come come to life uh, for you. Let me make sure I start with the, uh, the easier ones first. You will certainly have to be able to handle this on an exam. Now, I'm not sure, hopefully uh, you'll be able to see all this. All right, here, I think that will work. All right, let's go calculate pension expense and then we'll do the journal entries. This is uh, what you will have to do on, on an exam. All right, pension expense. Uh, you know, with an exam, you can almost, I used to do this even in my company, service costs, I know it's gonna be uh, interest costs. You can almost lay out the different components, but uh, I don't know if all of these, um, plus service cost, plus interest cost, minus expected return on assets. These are the three primary elements of pension expense that will always be there. Service cost, easy. I just pick up the service cost, 112. Interest cost, I'm gonna have to calculate, and that is gonna be uh, my interest rate, my discount rate, 6% times the PPO at beginning of the year, 850, 6% time 850. And uh, da, 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 da. 
I think that's going to be 51, but I'm going to check this because I don't want to have a mistake and have to re-record this whole video here. Uh, 850 times 6%, 51. All right. And now we're going to do this funky thing with the expected return on assets. It's not the real return on assets. The actual return was 11%. But we're not going to take credit for all 11%. We stick to the 10%. If the actual return was a 30% loss, we'd still do plus, you know, we would recognize a 10% gain regardless. Whatever happens, we don't care. It's gonna be 10% times what? This is gonna be 10% times my plan assets were 900 times 900. And that is reducing our net liability, right? If we make money on our asset, that's a good thing for us, uh, minus 90. Okay. now. Amortization of prior service cost. Let's see if we've got that. Uh, and this is how it will work. It will always just be given to you here. By the way, always, always a increase in expense because it's a um, increase in a liability. It's not an increase that happened this year. It happened in um, uh, 2018 and we're doing the counting. Um, uh, the, the, this happened prior and prior to 2018. This is just the 2018 amortization. So it wasn't actually, uh, well, I guess see. We're not really sure. It doesn't tell you whether that it started at 80, whether that was a, um, a new prior service cost amount or not. And maybe it was, I'll have to think about that here. No, this happened before. All right. Sorry about that. Now, we have a net loss in AOCI, actuarial loss, and an amortization was one. Because that's a loss, we know that's an increase in expense. And so plus one. So what is pension expense? We add 112 plus 51 minus 90 plus 8 plus 182. All right. Let's go do our first journal entry. This is pension expense. We just calculated. So debit pension expense. 82. Plan assets uh, increased uh, in expected amounts at least. Uh, we'll just take care of this. We got it. We have a problem here that we'll take care of. Here. That's going to be 90. We assume this is the hypothetical increase in plan assets here. We're going to have to take care of the fact later that our actual return was different. Okay, uh, next we have um, our prior service costs, OC, credit, OCI, prior service costs, and that was eight. Remember, uh, the prior service costs starts out as a, a debit because it was a loss. This was a debit in equity, and each year we're gonna credit that. Same thing here, credit OCI for um, actuarial loss of one. And then finally, credit the PBO for the things that increase. So what increased the PBO here? Uh, 112 plus 51, these were increases in the PBO. 163. So every item here in the calculation of pension expense ends up as a um, part of our journal entry because we're going to keep all these things separately. Even though on the balance sheet we'll net plan assets in the PBO, back in our books and records we have to separate them out. Why? Because we have to do footnotes and, and disclose a lot of information around the plan assets. And so we want to make sure we keep our books and records. Now, let's go take care of this because our plan assets, they didn't go up by 90. They went up by 11% of nine, 900. They went up by 99. Plan asset return, actual, let's do this, actual equals 900 times 11%. 99. However, we only debited plan assets for nine. So we've got to take care of that. Debit plan assets 
for nine. So we didn't get uh, we didn't get any credit for that on our expense. So where are we going to put that? OCI. Gain in OCI nine. What will happen to this nine? It will be amortized as a reduction of expense in uh, future years. Now, did we have anything else happen here? Uh, no uh, pension benefits, uh, no employer contributions. So therefore, uh, we're done here. There's the answer. Okay, got two more of these. Exercise 1710. Let's start looking very much like what you might see on an exam. I love the way these little charts. So uh, I'll pause the video here and, um, and try to work that. All right, I don't think I need that top part here. Uh, you need this, but we'll need that long-term rate. Expected return is 10%, so don't forget that part. Yeah, I maybe I can have room to do that. There we go. All right, let's calculate pension expense first, and then we'll do our journal entries. First, all, I just always do these in the same order. Uh, this is how you disclose them on the footnote in this order too. Service cost was how much? 20. Interest cost? Oh, this is so easy, they gave it to us. It must have been 10% though, because 12 divided by 120. I would never give it to you this easy. I'll just let you know that. So these are pluses. And um, actual return on plan assets were nine, but I have to do minus expected return. How much was my expected return? 10% um, times 80 minus eight. So we have a gain again. We return more than eight. Um, and so we'll have to uh, take care of that. And then um, guess what here? Easy, uh, all done. I better pull out my cheat sheet. I don't wanna screw this up. Yes, all, all done. So let's go do our journal entry now. Oh wait, let's add these up. 32 minus eight, uh, 24. All right, JE, debit, Pension expense, you better get that right. 24, I debit my plan assets. Eight, they really went up nine, so I gotta take care of that in another journal entry. And then um, I credit my PBO, my PBO increase with service costs and interest costs, 32. That's journal entry one. Now I've got to take care of the fact that my plan assets actually went up by nine. I only have eight, so I got to debit plan assets for another one. And I'm going to credit um, OCI gain of one. So that gets my plan assets right. And remember, that goes into the OCI bucket that we'll take care of later. Um, but look, have we taken care of everything? Hey, no, the PBO declined for benefits paid and the plan assets declined. And so we're gonna have to debit the PBO, right? Cause it declined, a debit to a uh, balance sheet item uh, is a, uh, decreases it, nine. And I'm gonna credit my plan assets for nine. There you go. That's a good little problem. You know, if you uh, didn't get that, you might want to come back to it and try to work it uh, at a later time. Don't do it right now because you'll just remember all my answers I just laid out for you. All right, there we go. And now, 
the last one, and it's a it's gonna look a lot uglier. And you know, I do love this one because I think uh, I don't know about this the exam that you may have, but uh, in prior exams I've done them almost exactly like this problem, just laid out almost exactly. That's how much I I really liked it. And so, uh, pause the video and and try to work that. Do the pension expense and uh, the journal entries both. All right, here you go. The last pension problem, and you guys are going to all be pension experts now. Uh, we're going to run out of space here. I, I'm going to run out of space, uh, but let's see what we can do here. All right, let's calculate pension expense. And so we start with service costs. And we, that's been given to us, 310. Interest costs, not given to us. We got to calculate it. So it's a discount rate, 7% times the beginning uh, PBO, 1118, 2300. So this is going to be 2300 times 7%. 161. Let's make sure I got that right. 2300, 7%, 161. All right. Minus expected return um, on assets. So we got to calculate that too. The actual return was 9% but we don't care. We always uh, will reduce pension expense by the expected return, the hypothetical. It's kind of like, it's kind of nice to do that. I wish I could do that with my own investments, but uh, only in pension expense, we get to do this. And so the beginning of the year plan assets were 2,400. So 2,400 times the expected return, 10% minus 240. All right, now, these are pluses. Amortization of prior service cost. And that's how this will always, it'll just be given to you. So amortization was 25. And that's always a plus because prior service costs are always an increase in the PBO, therefore a loss that gets into OCI, we bring losses out of OCI as expenses, right? That makes, hopefully makes a lot of sense to you. And then here we have uh, amortization of a gain. So this is a minus because here we have, uh, this is a gain uh, and so $6 is gonna reduce expense because it was a gain. If there's a loss, it would, and we're amortize it, we would amortize it into expense as an increase in expense. Let's add all these things up. Uh, 310 plus 161 minus 240 plus 25. And I believe this equals 250. Just gonna quickly check that. Two fifty, right on the nose. Okay, that's awesome. All right, let's go do our journal entry for pension expense. So we're gonna debit. Pension expense for how much? What we calculated. 250 debit plan assets for 240. And we have to debit the OCI gain. It was sitting in OCI as it's sitting in OCI as a big credit. And each year we're we're debiting that and crediting the expense. And that was for how much? That was six. And now we have some credits uh, to uh, uh, prior service costs, OCI prior service costs, a credit, and that was 25. 
And then we finally, we got our credit to our PBO. This is always the service costs plus the interest costs for 71. So I've got 496 here. Uh, I would always just check that when you're doing this uh, in exam. 496 in debits, 496 in credits. Boom. Awesome. Now, got some more journal entries to do. Uh, here is the first time I think we've seen this. Uh, cash contributions. So the employer made contributions to the pension uh, plan assets. And so we're going to debit plan assets for that amount, 245, and we're going to credit cash. This comes out of the company's cash. So the company's cash went down by 245, but the pension plan assets went up by 245 and also reduces the net net liability on the books. And so um, that don't, uh, don't forget that. That's a, all these are pretty easy. Um, have we taken care of the plan assets uh, yet? No, we still need to take care of the fact that we increased the plan assets uh, by 240. Actual change in assets was how much? It was 9%. 9% times 2,400. Equals 216. And so we increased the plan assets hypothetically by 240 when we calculated expense with the expected return, but they only went up by 216. So we're gonna have to you know, do the credit side first, plan assets by how much? 240 minus 216, 24. And now we have uh, OCI loss of 24. Keep in mind, this loss goes in the OCI for now and it'll be amortized uh, in the future. Are, are we done? And it would be so easy to say we're done, but we do have one last slide. It would be so easy to forget on the exam. You know, it's almost you want to check all these down. And I'll come back to this item, which we did not, did not use. Benefit payments, so easy to miss that, 270. So plan assets went down and the PBO went down. So we debit the PBO uh, for how much is that? 270. And we credit the plan assets. So these were payments to actual uh, beneficiaries. And so plan assets, uh, they, that those payments to beneficiaries always come out of the plan assets, never from cash, companies cash. They come out of the plan assets. That's why those assets are sitting there. And then because we paid people, that also reduces the liability dollar for dollar. Okay, one last thing quickly to cover here, and you could see this on the exam. Uh, and you can certainly, you should read about this in the textbook. There's another type of obligation called the accumulated benefit obligation. So pension, there's two, these are two different terms in pension benefit obligations. The projected benefit obligation in, in, includes an assumption for future wage increases. In other words, I'm working this year for a company and every year I'm gonna get three to 5% salary increases over 30 years, that could end up in a much larger payment in the future. So the PBO recognizes those future wage increases. And so uh, that's another assumption that the actuary has to make that can result in gains or losses. There was a lot of argument when, when pension accounting was created that we should not use that because wage increases have not been given yet, even though they're probable, that we should use the accumulated benefit obligation. Well, guess what? The FASB said we're gonna use the PBO, but the ABO is still disclosed. Uh, so uh, you can read uh, company's footnotes and you'll see the ABO and the PBO. But if you see the ABO in something like this, ignore it, we're not, we do not use it uh, for pension expense. And there you go, my friends, that's pension accounting in a nutshell. Uh, read the text, think about it. You know, you, there are a lot of moving parts here because you have the liability, the pension benefit obligation on one side, you have plan assets on the other side, both have a lot of moving parts, 
but there's a nice kind of formulaic approach here from the FASB to allow you to get this done. So thank you guys for uh, listening to my lecture and I hope uh, this will work out for you in the next example.